Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with some jury charge. Ready? Here we go. It is not unusual for the government to rely on the testimony of witnesses who admit to participating in criminal activity. The government must take its witnesses as it finds them and frequently must use such testimony in criminal prosecutions because otherwise it would be difficult or impossible to detect and prosecute wrongdoers. For this reason, the law allows the use of cooperating witness testimony, and you may consider the testimony of Dr. Gilman and Dr. Ross in determining whether the government has met its burden of proving Mr. Martoma's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. However, the testimony of cooperating witnesses, such as Dr. Gilman and Dr. Ross, must be scrutinized with special care and caution. The fact that a witness states that he has participated in criminal conduct and has entered into a non-prosecution agreement with the government may be considered by you as bearing on his credibility. It does not follow, of course, that simply because a person has admitted participating in a crime and has entered into a non-prosecution agreement with the government that he is incapable of giving a truthful account of what happened. Moreover, it is no concern of yours why the government made an agreement with a witness. Your sole concern is whether a witness has given truthful testimony. The testimony of cooperating witnesses should be given such weight as it deserves in light of all the facts and circumstances before you taking into account the witness's candor, the strength and accuracy of his recollection, his background, his demeanor, and the extent to which his testimony is or is not corroborated by other evidence in the case. As with other witnesses, you may consider whether the cooperating witnesses have an interest in the outcome of this case, and if so, whether that interest has affected their testimony. In this regard, you should bear in mind that a witness who has avoided prosecution by entering into a cooperation agreement with the government has an interest and motives different from those of any other witness in this case. In evaluating the testimony of such a witness, you should ask yourself whether the witness would benefit more by lying or by telling the truth. Was the witness's testimony influenced in any way by a belief or hope that he would receive favorable treatment by testifying falsely, or did he believe that his interests would be best served by testifying truthfully? If you believe that the witness was motivated by hopes of avoiding prosecution, was the motivation one that would cause him to lie or was it one that would cause him to tell the truth? In sum, you should consider all of the evidence in deciding that weight, if any, to give to the testimony of a cooperating witness. If you find that the testimony of a cooperating witness was false, you should reject it. However, if after a cautious and careful examination of the cooperating witness's testimony in light of all the evidence, you conclude that the cooperating witness told the truth. You should accept the testimony as credible and act upon it accordingly. As with any witness, let me emphasize that the issue of credibility need not be decided on an all-or-nothing basis. Even if you find that a witness testified falsely in one part, you may still accept his testimony in other parts, or you may disregard all of that witness's testimony. That is a determination entirely for you, the jury, to make. You have heard testimony from witnesses employed by a law enforcement agency. The fact that a witness is employed by a law enforcement agency does not mean that his or her testimony deserves more or less consideration or greater or lesser weight than that of any other witness. It is up to you to decide after reviewing 
all the evidence, what weight to give the testimony of law enforcement witnesses. I permitted Professor Paul Gompers and Dr. Thomas Wisniewski to express opinions about certain matters that are at issue in this case. These witnesses were permitted to give opinion testimony because they possess specialized knowledge as a result of their education, training, and work experience. In weighing the testimony of these witnesses, you may consider their qualifications, the reasons they gave for their opinions, and the reliability of the information supporting those opinions, as well as all the factors I have previously mentioned for evaluating witness testimony. You may also consider the compensation they received in connection with this case. To the extent you find the opinion testimony of these witnesses credible and reliable, you may rely on it. To the extent you do not, you need not rely on their testimony. Opinion testimony should receive whatever weight and credit, if any, you think appropriate, given all the other evidence in the case. Your verdict must be based solely upon the evidence developed at trial or the lack of evidence. It would be improper for you to consider in reaching your decision as to whether the government sustained its burden of proof, any personal feelings you may have about the defendant's race, religion, natural or national origin, sex, or age. Similarly, it would be improper for you to consider any personal feelings you may have about the race, religion, national origin, sex, or age of any witness or anyone else involved in this case. Both sides are entitled to a trial free of prejudice, and our judicial system cannot work unless you reach your verdict through a fair and impartial consideration of the evidence. You may not draw any inference, whether favorable or unfavorable, as to either side from the fact that no person other than Mr. Martoma is on trial here. You may not speculate as to the reasons why other persons are not on trial. Those matters are wholly outside your concern and have no bearing on your function as jurors. There are persons whose names you heard during the trial but who did not appear to testify. You should not draw any inference or reach any conclusions as to what they would have testified to had they been called. Their absence should not affect your judgment in any way. You should keep in mind my instruction, however, that the law does not impose on a defendant the burden or duty of calling any witness or producing any evidence. It is the government's burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt each element of the crimes charged in the indictment. Literary material. Let's see what we have here. This is called there's a little fixer-upper in all of us. And this is in the recent JCR magazine from NCRA. Ready? Here we go. On the hit HGTV show, Fixer Upper, Chip and Joanna Gaines restore and renovate old homes in the Waco, Texas area. Their design style, working relationship, and positivity are an inspiration to so many people all over the world. We court reporters can learn valuable lessons and habits from Chip and Joanna when it comes to our daily reporting and real-time goals. Make time for yourself and family. 
During each episode, Chip and Joanna always make time for their cute kids. It's paramount to keep in mind what's truly important, and that is to make family your number one priority. When I was a young mom, I always came home from the job, picked up my children, gave them a smooch, and spent time with them until bedtime. After the kiddos were tucked in bed, I headed off to the computer. Now that I'm an empty nester with no kids, of course the computer time is done at a more reasonable hour. My two children are young adults now and thriving in their own careers. When we reminisce, they remind me that I worked hard during their formative years and how they knew I was always there for them whenever they needed me. Have faith in yourself. When Chip and Joanna buy old properties, there is always the chance something could go horribly wrong with the renovation. Asbestos, old wiring, rusted pipes, you get the picture. They stay positive and overcome all of the obstacles that come their way together. As court reporters, we will always have those bad writing days for several reasons. There are the fast talkers, the witnesses who insist on answering the question before it gets out, the thick foreign accents or the construction noises just outside the deposition room window. We need to rely on our foundations that were laid in our training while maintaining a great attitude in order to overcome those unique and particular obstacles in our depositions and or courtroom settings. We are human and aren't perfect. While we only use audio backup as a tool, we are the guardians of the record and need to ensure we capture the verbatim testimony on every case. Always use courtesy when interrupting the proceedings and explain the rationale for your interruption in a concise and respectful way. More often than not, one always gets a better result when, say, when staying positive. Work hard to be the best you can be. The Gaineses are an extremely hardworking couple for sure. In addition to their TV show, they also have their own farm with animals. They now have a bakery, the silos, new furniture and rug lines, and a magazine to name a few. Court reporters work hard too. Every day we produce transcripts from our valuable clients in a timely manner and more often than not on an expedited basis. We should take a hard look at how we can renovate our writing and real-time skills so that we can work smarter and not harder to meet the deadlines we are faced with more and more. Real-time is and has been an in-demand service for attorneys for several years now. Court reporters of all experience levels need to understand that to stay relevant in today's legal environment we must maintain and continually hone our skills each and every day. I've written before, being real-time capable should be the goal of every court reporter now. My real-time goal is to always strive for 99.8% translation rate on every job. The prep work is essential to maintain or exceed that goal. My writing is constantly evolving even after 30 years of reporting. Writing short is paramount to the success of my translation rate for keeping up with the fast talkers and also being kind to my body, specifically my back and hands. We will get back to the article, take a little break. some more jury charge practice.
ready? Here we go. Mr. Martoma did not testify in this case. Under our Constitution, a defendant has no obligation to testify or to present any evidence because it is the government's burden to prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That burden remains with the government throughout the trial and never shifts to Mr. Martoma. A defendant is never required to prove that he is innocent. You may not attach any significance to the fact that Mr. Martoma did not testify. You may not draw any inference against him because he did not take the witness stand. You may not speculate as to why he did not testify, and you may not consider this against him in any way in your deliberations. You heard evidence that certain witnesses discussed the facts of the case and their testimony with lawyers before the witness appeared in court. Although you may consider that fact when you are evaluating a witness's credibility, you should be aware that there is nothing unusual or improper about a witness meeting with lawyers before testifying. Indeed, it would be unusual for a lawyer to call a witness to testify without such preparation. The weight you give to the fact or the nature of the witness's preparation for his or her testimony and what inferences you draw from such preparation are matters completely within your discretion. The indictment in this case refers to various dates. It does not matter if the indictment states that specific conduct is alleged to have occurred on or about a certain date, and the evidence indicates that, in fact, it was on another date. The law only requires a substantial similarity between the dates alleged in the indictment and the dates established through evidence at trial. You have heard evidence in the form of stipulations or agreements as to certain facts. Where the parties have entered into an agreement as to certain facts, you must regard the agreed upon facts as true. I will now turn to the law applicable to the specific charges in this case. As you know, the charges against Mr. Martoma are contained in an indictment. An indictment is not evidence of the guilt of a defendant. It is merely an accusation, a statement of charges made against a defendant. It gives the defendant notice of the charges against him and informs the court and the public of the nature of the accusation. Given that the indictment is proof of nothing, a defendant begins trial with an absolutely clean slate and without any evidence against him. The indictment in this case contains three charges or counts. Count 1, the conspiracy charge in relevant parts states, and we will stop there. Get back to that. Another time. Fixer Upper article. Ready? Here we go. You'll get a higher return on investment. After the homes are renovated on Fixer Upper, the homeowners definitely have a property to be proud of and one that is worth so much more. Once we, as court reporters, invest in our careers, we earn that return as well. The steps and path to being real-time proficient can be time-consuming, but so worth it in the end. When we go out on each job, we don't always have the luxury of knowing when a rough draft will be requested or an expedited transcript, transcript is needed. If your writing is great, you can say with confidence, yes, I can get that rough draft to you. 
your return on investment is that your editing time is so much less than before and you will earn more dollars for doing less work. You can shout out loud to yourself with pride and confidence after you hit send. Nailed it. Lessening your editing time means you can go enjoy your hobbies, your family, or just sit on the couch and watch Fixer Upper. All right, that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.